There's no doubt as engineers, we use a lot of maths in everything we do day in, day out. Something that we need to be comfortable with and use on a regular basis. But there's some parts of mathematics and formulas that I use more often to help with both my scheming and engineering skill set. So this is my most important mathematical formulas that I find for structural engineers. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. The first one is more about understanding structural mechanics and how loads flow through structures. And that's understanding the relationship between forces, shear forces, bending moments, curvature, and deflections. They're all related to each other as they're all related to the way the force flows through the structure and how things move. So by looking at a shear force diagram, you can work out what the bending moment diagram is, where the curvature is gonna go and how the deflection plot sh should look. So you know, need to know when you're looking at a de design from a plan, is it actually looking as you're expecting instead of just relying truly on the results that you've got there. So if you're going back up, it's the gradient of the curve that's actually related to the one above it. We start at deflections, move up to curvature, move across to moments, and then we just integrate again to get up to shear forces and we can integrate again to get up back up to forces. So if we're going through some of these basic solutions now, we can see how we're just looking at the area under the curve or the gradient of the plots to work out whether each ones are related to each other correctly. So it's an easy way to debug and see whether your results are correct. There's also some other simple formulas that you use all the time. It's about calculating bending moments, shear forces, and deflections. Well, we know from a simple formula set PL on four, we can work out the bending moment diagram or WL squared and eight. It's something that you use all the time. Now that's the extent of the bending moment. So for example, if you've got a bending moment between two spans, whether it's simply supported or continuous, you can work out whether the magnitude is correct. As that moment doesn't really change, it's just a peak between the top and the bottom is the delta of that bending moment. So by knowing these simple formulas, you can do a quick sum to see whether the forces are correct about how much load is going to which location. For example, in a continuous beam, you'll have both troughs and peaks. The difference between those points is just that WL squared on eight. Although the magnitudes might be slightly different, it just means that curve has moved up or down depending on the fixity on either end of it. Another one that you use all the time is 5 WL to the 4th and 384 EI. So when you've got a uniformly distributed load, what is the deflections? And something that I use on a regular basis to work out whether my deflections are in the right magnitude. So if you've just got a uniformly distributed load on a cantilever, it's just WL squared on two. So if we go back to that other diagram that we talked about, just understanding the difference between bending moments and shear force diagrams, we know that we've got a uniformly distributed load. Therefore, it would be a triangular distribution based on that UDL. We can work at the reaction at one point, so we know the peak area is P times L. So if we're trying to work out the area under the curve, it's PL squared. And then we just need to divide it by two to get the full area under the curve. So by knowing the relations between bending moments and shear forces that we talked about before, we can work out simple actions like that. And we can stack up things such as point loads or other moments to find out what that final solution would be. When we're talking about all stiffness and movement, another important one that we use all the time is BD cubed on 12. So what is the I section of a rectangular cube? But sometimes you don't have a full section there. You might just have a truss with a top cord and a bottom cord. What is the stiffness of that? Well, when we look back at the stiffness formulas, it's just I plus AH squared. So it's the area and how far they are away from that center point. So you can see, even though they are maybe small when you've got two little points from each other, the AH squared is the thing that's actually giving the stiffness to the truss system. So that's where you can equate a simple truss to a line load to see how the loads distribute. And to see whether you're getting the correct formulas, just using AH squared, it will give you a rough figure of what deflections you should be seeing out of that truss system. Something about structural mechanics as well is about how buildings actually behave. And it's the fact that load actually diverges. It's much like a force flowing down an area, it'll want to go to the most least stressed places first. So load will disperse as much as it's physically possible, but it's moving to the stiffest path. Whichever path is going to be stiffer is where it's going. You see, for example, if you've got a wall, the load just doesn't keep going straight down that single point load location. It will spread out until it's getting even force across the whole system. That's because it's trying to transfer to the stiffest location possible. The other one where this becomes in useful, not only in loads and knowing that how it's diverging, is the fact that if you've got two beams on top of each other, what is the load distribution between the two of them? And it'll just be the differences in the eye. So if both beams have the exactly same eye section, the load will be evenly distributed. But as the stiffness of one of those beams increases, the load will be distributed based on their eye, not the depth of the section. As you increase the eye of one of them, the load will be distributed based on the eye of that beam with the beam with the highest eye taking the greatest portion of the load. 
Now this becomes a little bit harder when you've got different materials. But it's the same thing. The stiffness of the beam is Young's modulus E times y i. So therefore you can do a weighted average of E times i to work out how much load is going to each portion of a certain element. Especially in composite sections, there's a good way to distribute the load between the two different elements. Now for concrete structures, it gets a little bit more complex as there are different aspects that we need to watch out for. The same thing about the principal stresses on each face. There's a simple rule of thumb that I can use on a daily basis to try and size up my structures of how deep do they need to be or how wide do they need to be, depending on which area is fixed. With concrete structures, there's a simple rule of M divided by BD squared. Now it's a bit of a rework on that M divided by the strength of materials. Essentially doing the same thing. It's giving you a ratio of how stressed each of those elements are. And from this simple rule set, you can say that if I'm somewhere between three and five for a concrete slab, I'm in an efficient design ratio. Where if I have a lower ratio, I have a member that's potentially too big. If I have a higher ratio, I'm probably going to have deflection limit. Now this is for concrete slabs, but when you've got your beams or header beams and structures, where should I be sitting? As in typically not governing the deflection of the structure. This is where you're trying to limit what is it going to be the maximum shear stress or what is going to be the maximum bending that system can take before it be over reinforced. This is where at the very max you're sitting up near a 10 or a 15 before you have those problems of not being able to get enough reinforcement in there or having shear force actually fail it before it receives that load. So by using these simple rule sets and these maximum values you can rework the formula to either solve for a B or a D, depending on which area is fixed in your design. So you might say, well, if you're fixing the depth, it means that you need to have a member that is this big. Now, realistically, can it be that big? So it's a quick, simple way that you can tell the architect whether the solution is actually physically possible or not. Yes, you will need to do a detailed design later, but it gives you a rough little thumb whether you're in the right magnitude or not. The reason why the slab deflection is so less is because it's typically governed by deflection more so than maximum flexure or shear capacity. That's why from rules of thumb and from many years of practice, you come up with the simple rule between three and five with the most effective solution for your slab design. Area formulas and calculating the area and tributary areas on columns is something that I use on a daily basis as well. Working out what the load is coming down on that column, is it actually of the right magnitude and is it come to the right area? So something I do all the time is working out the distance between the columns and working out how much load is going on there. Now, most of the time those areas are not square areas. They're more of those Vera noise circles which radiate from one point. So you'll have these funny oblong shapes. So you make sure you radiate from these circles to find out what the actual real tributary area is on that column. So this gives you a more effective solution than just relying on a simple hand comp of that square radius. The square radius will get you most of the way there and will allow you to design those columns, if not conservatively, within the right order of magnitude. But when you're looking at those load rundowns, making sure you're somewhere between 10 and 15 KPA on the loading, when you add up all the tributary areas plus the load that's applied to that column, or make sure that you're in the right area of magnitude for your design. Probably the one that I use the most is Pythagoras' theorem. Why do you say that? It's because force always diverges as we talked about earlier. If I'm doing strut and tie, working out the different force angles from steel trusses, is it in the right order? Pythagoras' theorem comes into handy day in, day out. So most of the time we're dealing with right angle triangles. So from Pythagoras' theorem, we know that the square root of A squared plus B squared is equal to C. So we can work out which force is on the diagonal and where those other loads are going. And we can also rework that the other way, just try and either solve A, solve B, depending on what knowns we have. So by knowing Pythagoras' theorem, not only do you know what your strutting forces are going to be, how the loads are amplified and where the loads are going. Back in high school, who thought they would be using Pythagoras' theorem on such a regular basis? If you've got any other formulas that you use on a regular basis that I've missed, please comment below. I'm always interested to hear what other people use. And if you're interested about the 10 top things that I think that you can use to help progress your career as a structural engineer, I've got a link to a video up here. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. I've got links to my Patreon in the below description or become a YouTube member. Without the support of my either Patreons or YouTube members, this type of content would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.